Sherman Oaks Galleria has had a tough life. It's been invaded by Judge Reinhold, a rogue commando, and killer robots from the future. But did you know that it also had to deal with ED-209's dopey nephews? Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're taking a trip to the Chopping Mall. <laughs> Released in 1986, Jim Wynorski's film sounds like it should be a slasher movie, but instead it's a tale of teens trapped in a mall and stalked by killer security bots. This is another low-budget quickie from Roger and Julie Corman, but it's gone on to cult infamy because it was a video store staple in the late 80s and early 90s. Seriously, we rented this movie constantly in high school. But enough about that. Can Chopping Mall massacre its way to a 5 barf bag rating? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Electric Eye Slide, Crystal Gardner, and Tracy Johnson. Sorry if I murdered your last name, Tracy. If you'd like to help sponsor some videos, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment in the description below. And now, let's get bloody. We fade in on this jewelry. It's not often we see how Corman movies get financed. And if this music sounds familiar, it's because it was used in Death Stalker 2. Budget Michael Bean here pulls a little smash and grab. But he didn't realize he's about to get busted by this budget ED-209. Stop right there and surrender your weapon. Fun fact, director Jim Wynorski did the voice for the Killbots in Chopping Mall. And don't look now, but Johnny Five is really pissed off. How do I know? Because he tases this dude. Did you just tase him, bro? That's pretty revolting. Wait, that's the end of the movie? Okay, let's go to the gore card. Oh, it's just an industrial film. A movie within a movie. Very meta. This lady's like, all right, clear out, everyone. We need this space for a Barbizon modeling seminar and a Tiffany concert. Then this guy steps in to deliver some exposition. I'd like you all to meet your brand new security team. They merely detain intruders until the computer located on the roof can patch into the mall phone system and send an alarm to the police. Oh, hey, it's Mary Warrenov and Paul Bartel. Those aren't budget versions. That's really them. Wait, these things are too chunky to be Johnny Five. They're more like Johnny Six. Well, he's busy blabbing about all the stuff these bots can do. This seems like a good time to tell you that Chopping Mall was originally titled Kill Bots. That title didn't resonate with audiences, so it was retitled as Chopping Mall, had 15 minutes of footage cut, and was re-released. Absolutely nothing can go wrong. And famous last words. Anytime you need to say absolutely nothing can go wrong, you know everything is about to go wrong. We're now approaching our final destination, Itchy and Scratchy Land. The amusement park of the future where nothing can possibly go wrong. Uh, possibly go wrong. <laughs> that's the first thing that's ever gone wrong. Ooh, look at that title font. That just screams 80s high tech. And we head into the credits. If this mall looks familiar, it's because Chopping Mall was shot at the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which was also used in Commando, Terminator 2, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and a bunch of other movies. Wynorski's team had to shoot after hours and promise not to damage anything. The head of security was not a fan of Wynorski's crew and continually gave them grief. And it wouldn't be a Wynorski movie without a lot of scantily clad ladies. Julie Corman, Roger's wife, gets the producer's credit here. But make no mistake, the King of the Bee movies was heavily involved in the production of Chopping Mall. Look at the posters. Is this the office set from Evil Ed? Turns out, these are all posters from other Roger Corman productions. Clearly, this chef went to the Barth Bag School of Culinary Arts. Oh, honey, <laughs> you're breaking my heart. And we meet leading lady Allison, played by Kelly Maroney, and her friend Susie, aka Scream Queen Barbara Crampton. Maroney wasn't the first choice for the lead. Dana Kimmel was originally cast, but didn't want to do any sex or nudity. Wynorski then decided to give Maroney the part, mostly because, as he explains it, he wanted to date her. Hi. Later that night, there's clearly been a quickening, judging by all this lightning. There can be only one. And if you guessed all this lightning was going to turn our budget T-800s into murderous killbots, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. <laughs> we then jump over here to Ashley Furniture. These three Gordon Gecko wannabes are wondering if their finance degrees were a waste of time. Do you kids even remember Gordon Gecko? Christ, I'm old. You got the beer? Great. Come on. They've got a big party plan, but Ferdy needs some reassurance. Don't 
worry. If you were worried, we don't have enough characters for our killbots to slaughter. Don't panic. These two are on their way to the party. Hey, 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 save it for the party. Pace yourself, pervs. Back in the mall, Mike's creeping on Leslie, but she seems okay with it. Are you a horny <laughs> bastard? <laughs> no, no, not like that, Leslie. Like this. Oh, yeah. They're ready to get the party started early, but Dad interrupts. What can't you wait for, Michael? Awkward. Man, this guy is really chewing the scenery. Allison and Susie, meanwhile, are getting ready for the big party. Why do I have the feeling I'm going to regret this in the morning? <laughs> um, probably because most of you will be murdered by killer robots. I don't know, just a hunch. Also, why does this mall have a girl's locker room? I'm not complaining, I'm just curious. Back at the lab, Vinkman shows up for his shift. And since it's been a while since we've had anyone die, I guess we might as well kill him off. Pretty underwhelming kill, if we're being honest. Down at the furniture store, our totally tubular party is underway. I mean, just look at this dancing. It's like a melanin-deficient soul train up in here. Oh good, Terleski's back. He's just a treasure in this movie. Then Ferdy and Allison meet. Ferdy Mizell, meet Allison Parks. Hi. It's kind of like nerd love at first sight. Hi. Then ED-209 finally decides to start this plot. He could kill them all right now, but he decides to window shop instead. Given chopping malls low budget, Winorski and crew were forced to get creative. The robots were built out of wheelchairs, treads, and other scrap parts. They built five of them in total. Some were remote controlled and others were moved with cables kept out of frame. After the dance party is over, everyone settles in for the makeout sesh. This dude has the greatest pickup line ever. You smell like pepperoni. I like pepperoni. Hopefully she likes sausage. Here you are. I hope you like it big sausage style. I will say it's sort of odd that all these sexual shenanigans are happening in such close proximity. This must be extra true for Allison and Furry, who aren't making out at all, but are instead watching Corman's Attack of the Crab Monsters on TV. <laughs> oh no, you're not fooling me again, movie. Outside, Dick Miller gets a little filthy. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he's mopping up this mess. Miller's playing Walter Paisley, which was the same name as his character in A Bucket of Blood, another Corman classic. Go ahead and laugh, you guys. But if I ever find a little bastard that did this, a dead meat. They're <laughs> James A. Janice? Before he can finish mopping, one of the killbots shows up and shoots this cable at him. What the hell is that? Then fries him like a Florida felon. Ah! 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 And that, my friends, is why you hired Dick Miller. Dude is electrifying even in bit parts. But at least this robot is polite. Thank you. Have a nice day. Mike then heads out to get his lady a pack of smokes. And just like your dad, he's not coming back. The difference here is Mike didn't come back because he was accosted by a killbot. Your dad just didn't want you. Leslie heads off on a reconnaissance mission and finds Mike. Ha, <laughs> here's the problem. The Killbot shaving attachment clearly isn't working right. And now the Killbots are after her. After a few test shots, it finally gets its aim assist up and running. <laughs> Headshot. Thank you. Have a nice day. Most polite sniper ever. With the Killbots hot on their heels, everyone flees to the stock room. It's nice these guys are about as accurate as stormtroopers now, at least. Would hate to wipe out the whole cast with 45 minutes left in the movie. And just when you think things couldn't get any worse, the mall goes full lockdown. The security doors don't open until 6. Oh no, we're never gonna get out of here. Yes, we are. Oh hey, they finally gave budget Eli Manning some more lines. Then they get split up, the guys flee, and the girls wind up in the air vents. They're trying to french fry us. Now I know how a TV dinner feels. Back downstairs, the fellas show us what a wild bunch they are by arming themselves at peck and paws. How are we gonna get in? Don't worry, I got the keys. This is just as good as that exact same scene in Red Dawn, but not nearly as good as the exact same scene they were ripping off in Dawn of the Dead. At any rate, California sure was different back in the 80s. Let's go send those fuckers a rambo -gram. I was wrong when I called these guys the Wild Bunch earlier. The khakis definitely make them the Mild Bunch. You sure you know how to shoot that? It's a Dirty Harry 24 times. Then Wyatt Twerp and his gang reenact the shooting at the OK Corral. Too bad it wasn't by the Orange Julius. The OJ Corral had a better ring to it. They must have set all their weapons to miss. 
But Killbot is impervious to bullets, but this propane tank does a solid job on him. Tanks a lot. Well, we're not finished yet. We still got two more of these suckers around here someplace. The girls, meanwhile, have wandered into an O'Reilly's Auto Parts. Man, this mall has everything. Outside, Johnny Six is checking out some pumps. Unfortunately, he can only wear track shoes. I will say, it's getting pretty gassy in here as the girls make Molotov cocktails. Regular or unleaded? It gets the job done. And is she patting her bra with Chekhov's flair? Out in the mall, they're attacked by this killbot, but he's clearly flame resistant. It's not done! This is one flame war the ladies aren't going to win. Exterminate! Exterminate! Then Barbara Crampton takes a laser in the knee and catches on fire. You could say her career is going up in smoke, but the good news is she smells delicious. Everyone flees and it looks like things are escalating. The killbot takes the elevator, which promptly gets blown up. Man, I hate when I go to the mall and there's a magic show. And I have to admit, this feels like a missed opportunity for a tanks have a nice day catchphrase. After regrouping, they form a plan. They can shut down the computer, they can shut down the robots. Computer, huh? Let's go trash the fucker. Man, this is some aggressive mall walking. Then Greg decides to do a little diving. Rush Judge gives that a 2.5. And if you thought these robots were like Claptrap in Borderlands and thwarted by stairs, guess again. Fun fact, the robots were too big to fit on the escalator, so this is a random crew member wearing the top of a robot as a costume. Of course, you may be wondering why these escalators are now running when they weren't a few minutes ago. <laughs> and you may be wondering why they reused the same robot on an escalator sequence twice in less than two minutes. They regroup in the perfume aisle and come up with this plan. You know, maybe we'd all stand a better chance if we split up. <laughs> yeah, great idea. Worked really well last time. The moment any one of us go out there, we're dead meat. Look, you're no more James A. Janice than Dick Miller is. I guess I'm just not used to being chased around a mall in the middle of the night by killer robots. You grow up dreaming of being an actress, and you know you made it when you get to say that line. The killbot eventually breaks in. I feel like it's a missed opportunity that he didn't shout, oh yeah, here. But they fool it with this dinner theater version of Mannequin 2. Man, what if Kim Cattrall was one of those mannequins? And somehow a mirror reflects a laser shot and the killbot has blasted itself. Linda gets hit, and Rick decides the best course of action is to drive a golf cart into the killbot at like four miles per hour. Rick, no! I, for one, am shocked this didn't work. The killbot blows up, but I'd rather you focus your attention on this obvious mannequin. Now, Allison and Ferdy are the only people left alive, and they basically have matching outfits. They split up, because of course they do, and Allison walks right into this jump scare. <laughs> And then she finds another. There must be a sale on jump scares at the mall this week. Allison's creeping around like she's James Earl Cash, but she's clearly not good at manhunt because she gets spotted. I like that this killbot is ready to raise the roof. Raise the roof? Raise it! Where are my bitches? So yeah, splitting up was a stellar idea. Ferdy draws the killbot away and it tries to extinguish his life. Literally. After some cat and mouse, which actually takes place in a pet store, Allison makes a break for it. I've heard of hanging out at the mall, but this seems extreme. Then she decides to drop in on the lower level. I don't know, she seems more Becky Connor than Sarah Connor. Then she heads to the hardware store. This seems like an odd time for a home improvement project, but whatever makes you happy. The killbot charges in, but its treads are no match for the slippery floor. <laughs> and to be honest, this seems like a design flaw. Then she goes all Ric Flair and lights the killbot on fire. Woo! And Johnny Five is definitely no longer alive. You could say he really flamed out. And if you guessed Ferdy was still alive, give yourself another screenwriter's credit. Aw, oh, happy ending. At least until Black Friday. But wait, if you guessed there was a swerve ending coming, you were right. There's one killbot left. I wonder if Nick Fury will show up and recruit him into the Avengers. Thank you. Have a nice day. And that is Chopping Mall. <laughs> The film's poster makes you think this is going to be a slasher film, but instead we get this weirdly entertaining sci-fi horror flick. With a tiny budget and a tight shooting schedule, Chopping Mall turned out pretty well, all things considered. But can these killbots fill five shopping bags with body parts? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Chopping Mall is pretty light. We're treated to a sliced throat, a body tossed off a ledge, an electrocution, and that classic exploding head. The exploding head gag is the stuff of legend, and it's good enough to get Chopping Mall a two-barf bag rating all by itself. 
This isn't a sick flick, but it does earn its cult reputation anyway. Looking for another Corman production with more gore? Then be sure to check out my review of Humanoids from the Deep. You'll find a link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.